Are you winning, son? As long as there's music, I'll keep on dancing. Ugh. Naughty little angels deserve a good banking. You're definitely winning, son. Beautiful. When it comes to games that are simple, pure fun, you can't do much better than Bayonetta. We all have that game that even with a backlog of unplayed games to go through, we end up returning to an old favorite instead. Since it came out on PC a few years ago, Bayonetta has been one of those games for me. I have a bunch of games that I want to cover for the channel, and I will, but I just recently had hunkering over turning to Bayonetta, so I thought, why not do a video on this incredible game while I'm at it? Bayonetta is a game that's easy to learn, but extremely difficult to master with a complex combat system with plenty of depth. It also features one of the most likable and memorable game protagonists around. Well, Kitty, what do you think we should do? He's hurt you, has he? Well... We can't be having that now, can we? Bayonetta is nearly unmatched in the character action genre, a genre that was kickstarted by its director, Hideki Kamiya, the director of Devil May Cry. Bayonetta is one of those games that you'll come back to over and over again to replay, seeing how much better you could do, tackling new challenges, trying new weapon combinations. And one that's always on hand if I want to play something when I don't know what to play. There'll be plenty of time for pillow talk afterwards. So how did Bayonetta come together? Feeling stifled by Capcom with their focus on sequels and not taking as many risks, a number of key Capcom staff left the company to eventually form what was Platinum Games, one of them being Hideki Kamiya, known for his work on Resident Evil 2, Devil May Cry, Beautiful Joe, and Okami. The studio spent much of their early days creating game pitches to potential publishers. Funny enough, early on Kamiya was focused more on casual games, until one day one of the leaders at Platinum wanted to see another character action game from Kamiya. Assigned to play to the strengths of the studio, as many staff at Platinum had worked in the space in the past, they decided to make a character action game. This time, however, they wanted to change it up with a female lead, or in the words of Kamiya, a sexy and amorous female character. Never change, Kamiya. The name Bayonetta comes from adding a feminine twist to the term Bayonet. Sega was looking for a character action game and would eventually settle as a publisher for Bayonetta. So they got to cranking out a prototype to get things rolling and get a feel for how the combat would be. It's really interesting and fascinating to watch this footage here. The core of the gameplay came together really quickly, and there must be some talented indie dev out there who can make use of something like this and create an indie style Bayonetta. While the prototype came together quite quickly, the big challenge now was getting the design of Bayonetta. Looking for a woman's touch, Kamiya chose Mari Shimazaki to design Bayonetta. They went through many iterations of what Bayonetta looked like. The two main points from Kamiya was that Bayonetta was a witch, and to have her black to go with the witch theme. When testing out, they did have a struggle with the dark color in her hair, making it difficult to play. It was difficult for players to gauge reactions from Bayonetta's movements. They tried different hair colors, but still couldn't find something that worked. Eventually, Kamiya went back more to the original designs and started to focus more on what worked there. The hair was still an issue, but to solve it, as a witch with magical powers, they decided to have her hair as her clothes, and they found that did the trick. Shimazaki started to add a whole bunch of little details to help Bayonetta stand out, and had a lot of freedom on that front, and ended up now with the iconic design of Bayonetta. Well, mostly. Where did the glasses come from? Kamiya wanted glasses to give Bayonetta a sense of authority. What started out as a joke turned out to be that everyone on the team loved it. However, the voices of God, as Kamiya says, I'm guessing Sega here, didn't want the glasses, and there was a lot of back and forth, with Kamiya and Ko eventually winning out, and thank goodness for that. It's so weird to look at images with Bayonetta without glasses. It's like seeing someone in real life that you've only seen with glasses, and then how they look without glasses. It's just wrong. Which leads me to asking, how many game protagonists actually wear glasses? And to be clear, glasses, not shades, sunglasses. There's Bayonetta, there's Gordon Freeman. As far as playable characters go, you have Luca from Chrono Trigger, you have Quistis from Final Fantasy VIII, Jeff from Earthbound, and you have other odds and ends with the supporting cast wear glasses, Nico and Devil May Cry 5, Otacon. Man, there's not really a whole lot when it comes to characters with glasses in games, especially at the protagonist level. Do leave a comment of other playable characters with glasses, and I'm again talking about more reading glasses as opposed to shades. Oh, and on that note, glasses were added to the rest of the main characters as well. 
On that note of the cast, Bayonetta has a small, extremely strong cast of characters. Let's first start with Bayonetta herself. Don't fuck with the witch. Bayonetta to me is just one of the most likable characters in gaming. Plus, any character that makes Smash Bros. see this is A-OK -okay in my book. It could've been so easy for them to just come up with a female version of Dante, but they didn't. Sure, they do drop a few Dante references here and there in the game. But Bayonetta stands on her own with her design and personality. In many ways, I think I enjoy her overall more than Dante. She's likable, she's extremely feminine, she's attractive, she's competent, she can handle her own, but she isn't flawless, and she goes through numerous setbacks throughout the game. Not just this on dying, but in the plot as well. She makes use of her sexuality, and instead isn't just a sex object. That said, the game doesn't slack on fan service. Further down you go, the harder it is to not notice the reality of things. Cheshire, look. Oh, I'm looking. Plus, giving her a British accent was just the right touch of conveying that strong personality of hers. I feel like a fucking celebrity in this town. I don't want to go too deep in this because there's been a number of YouTubers who have made YouTube careers around this subject, but Bayonetta is an example of strong female character done right. While she's very competent and skilled at what she does, she isn't a Mary Sue or an unlikable prick. Her femininity isn't downplayed, which I've seen so many developers get wrong over the last decade or so, when it comes to creating strong female characters, in which they basically create a man, just put him in a very masculine woman's body, and can't be defeated, like, ever. While she does have setbacks, she doesn't get whiny about it, but instead rises up to overcome these challenges. It's always amusing to me how Japan has gotten this shit right for years and years. Hell, the first game that Kamiya directed, Resident Evil 2, had a strong, capable, likable female character. And even in the West, this is mostly not an issue until the last decade or so when we've seen the rise of the Tumblr or Twitter writer who completely missed the point when it comes to creating strong female characters. We want likable characters that are fun, attractive, flawed, and grow over their journey. This isn't rocket science, people. Oh, and since I'm writing this, the topic of tall woman has come up with tall vampire lady in Resident Evil 8, estimates put Bayonetta at around 8 feet tall which makes her a fair amount shorter, as Tall Vampire Lady is about 9 foot 6. So while Bayonetta is a great character on her own, what helps is the standout cast that we have around her. Firstly, we have Enzo, who's somewhat of the joke character. I do wish Enzo was made more use of in the game. Besides the intro and ending, he doesn't really do a whole lot. But when he's around, he's some great comic relief. He reminds me a lot of Joe Pesci in Home Alone. I go to... I come! I come! I come! Day. I'm screwed! Ah, it's gonna take every cent I earned on this charade to pay for the damage! Granted, as you first get into the game, you'll be very likely hearing him at the end of every level. Oh, what a day! But more on that later. Rodin is our devil shopkeeper friend, and yep, that's the voice of Lee from Walking Dead. Next time you put your hands on me. You better make sure I'm dead. Now move out the way. Rodin and Bayonetta have a lot of fun interactions on a professional level. We'll be collecting LPs throughout the game, and we can return it to him so he can put together new weapons for us to use. to pound into shape, but the workmanship's solid. Now, go put this thing to good use. As we go through the game, we'll be able to access the shop to get new abilities, items, and techniques, using the currency in the game, the rings. Luca is a fun character that helps drive the plot forward, and does serve as a bit of an exposition supplier. He has that right mix of being a bit annoying, but still likable and competent. And the way Bayonetta toys around with him early on and how she does ease up as time goes on is a really fun dynamic. Damn. What the? I've often seen a girl without lipstick. 
But lipstick without a girl? Most curious, isn't it, Cheshire? What about you? You really think I'm gonna let myself be seen in public with a girl looking all beat up like that? Oh. I look dreadful, do I? Huh? You'll have to learn to wipe that stupid look off your face, or I'll never let you keep chasing me around this world. Got that? Luca? But by far the most fun interactions come between Bayonetta and Cereza. And it's really fun to watch how it shifts over the course of the game, starting with Bayonetta showing very little tolerance to Cereza. If there's two things I hate in this world, it's cockroaches and crying babies. Well, a crying baby cockroach would be truly terrible. So don't you dare cry. To eventually coming around and caring about her. <laughs> mommy! Mommy! <laughs> it's okay, little one. I'll be right back. As well as Cereza getting more strong and confident as the game goes on. When I grow up, I'll be strong too, and I'll protect my money. But the best cutscenes in the game come from these interactions between Bayonetta and Cereza. Oh, and the whole mommy thing? We'll come back to that more later in the story section. Motherhood isn't covered a whole lot in games, especially from a protagonist standpoint. Bayonetta doesn't go too deep with the idea, but it is there. It's also why you see a lot of people wonder if Bayonetta is Joker's mom. And of course, we must mention Jean. And if we're going to compare it to Devil May Cry, she's the Virgil equivalent as the rival of Bayonetta. It's a fun rivalry how it changes throughout the game and our dealings with her. And unlike Bayonetta, the creation of Jean and her design was much easier. In fact, most of the other characters came together pretty quickly in comparison to Bayonetta. But let's talk about why we're here to play this game. Let's talk about the gameplay and the combat of Bayonetta. Boom! Amongst the various character action games out there, Bayonetta's combat stands as one of the best combat systems. It's interesting to look at the past that Kamina's team here, from Devil May Cry, Beautiful Joe, and Akami, what the team pulled from these areas, and what new additions they made to create the combat system of Bayonetta. One of the main goals of combat was to focus on the feminine through the movements of Bayonetta. The team had several dancers addition to base Bayonetta's movements after. The funny thing is the last addition was late, didn't listen to the music that was provided for her to dance to prior to, but danced to it on the spot. It was Maiko Uchida who delivered the motion of Bayonetta and who they went with. And just watching these behind the scenes videos, it's so surreal to see her dancing. I'm super curious to see how the other dancers look like with their performances, but the behind the scenes did not include that unfortunately. From jumping to dodging, the simple act of moving Bayonetta around feels really enjoyable. We have a number of combos in Bayonetta, like a lot of combos, mixing in punches and kicks, which each have their respective buttons. You can lock on to enemies, but I found myself rarely making use of the ability compared to other character action games. There's just something different about Bayonetta's movements that make it mostly unnecessary. That said, it is available, should you wish. Another key aspect of these combos are those that end with a wicked weave. That is when Bayonetta summons a demon force as a fist or foot at the end with combos through her hair. These have much higher levels of damage than normal attacks and will do wonders for your scoring. A great addition is the loading screens where you can pause the game and try out combos, and the game shows you how many times you have made use of those combos. It's nice how the list shifts depending on how you start the combo to see what options you have available in that area. What differs about Bayonetta compared to other similar titles at the time is the use of Dodge Offset, which has since seen its way into other Platinum games and other games in a similar vein. It's a great little addition to add plenty of debt to the combat, and if you want to rank higher in missions instead of getting those stone rankings over and over, it's essential to learn dodge offset. Here's an issue from previous games. You're in the midst of a combo, but an enemy attacks, breaking your combo if you dodge. So what does Bayonetta do here that's different? By holding down these attack buttons while dodging, we don't break our combo, but instead can continue them after the dodge. This takes a bit to learn, but once you do, it just clicks and you'll wonder why this wasn't included sooner in other similar games. But here lies the problem with it. The game doesn't do a great job of explaining how it works. If you're new to the game, I do recommend go looking at videos on YouTube about Dodge Offset, or Matthew Matosis has a great video covering some of these mechanics. I'll have these videos in the description below. Granted, Platinum has always been a bit guilty of this when it comes to its combat mechanics. The parry system in Metal Gear Rising wasn't overly well explained as well. Bayonetta should have done a much better job in explaining how the Dodge Offset works. It plays such a large factor in how well you do, how well you score, and how quickly you'll take down enemies. Oh, and on that note of parrying, you can get the parry ability here, although it requires a large amount of currency to buy, and to be frank, I've never really tried it out. The only interest Kamiya seems to show in blocking is people on Twitter. Please block me, Kamiya. If there is any outcome of this video, that would be it. 
To talk more about dodging, we have a single button devoted to it instead of the lock on roll or jump style for Devil May Cry when it came to dodging. It works really well and again feels elegant and fluid. We have plenty of warning of enemy attacks so it's never a case of enemy comes off screen and hits me. It's similar to a lot of character action games where you won't be hit off screen unless you can see them. There are some projectile attacks that can come off screen, but we have plenty of warning through auditory cues. The game is always fair on this front, which I really appreciate. Never did I really feel something was cheap or unfair, but instead it was my fault. If you dodge at just the right time, you'll activate Witch Time which slows the world down around us and can rack up some serious damage and combos. Unlike Beautiful Joe, it's a correct dodge that activates slow motion, as opposed to enabling it ourselves in Beautiful Joe. Well, that's partially true, as there's an ability we could buy from the item store later on that allows us to activate which time at any point at the expense of our magic gauge. So, what is this magic gauge for? Well, the main use will be for our torture attacks. Build up that meter and we'll be able to make use of these attacks. Each one is unique depending on the enemy type, and they get pretty creative with them. It can be a bit annoying that the buttons vary on the enemy. I wish they just chose a single button regardless of the enemy, because that brief pause of beacon can take away from some of your damage and your score. You can unlock some abilities from the store for a pretty penny to make use of magic gauge in other areas. For example, making a replica bayonetta, sending out bats, and more. We have a large variety of weapons that we can make use of in bayonetta. As we progress through the game, we will collect LPs that we could give to Rodin to make into our weapons. There's a nice variety of what we have available to us. Some we could set to our feet or hands, some just our hands, and some just our feet. While the game's combos more or less remain the same regardless of weapon choice, the weapons we have will have different impacts depending on what you choose and where you place them. You could switch between two weapon sets in real time, or you could simply go to the menu and switch out options. For example, I love to make use of the whip to stay airbound and bring enemies towards me before switching to my other weapon. This gives you many different combinations and styles that you can make use of, and one of the reasons why Bayonetta is so replayable. Oh, and that music? They went for an early 70s pop with a mix of jazz feeling to it. In other ways, it also feels very influenced by musicals, and it works extremely well for fights, and the game in general. Plus, the use of Fly Me to the Moon is a great touch as well. What about the scoring system in Bayonetta? It differs quite a bit from Devil May Cry, where there's no DCBAS system on the screen during combat. It's not as clear as how it actually works, and I did have to look it up in order to get a better idea of it. It is a lot more forgiving though. To get higher scores, you'll need to keep short amounts of time in between attacks, make use of your dodging, your dodge offsets, witch time, wicked weaves, and torture attacks. Continuous punches and kicks will create diminishing results, but making use of wicked weaves will reset this. Hence, it's why you really want to spend some time learning dodge offsets so you can land those earlier. Once you get an understanding of the combat and the scoring system, you'll be spending far less time button mashing, instead pressing and holding, then moving to the next attack, dodge offsetting, and continuing. It's once you understand this, you'll move away from the stone awards to higher awards at the end of the level. As well as getting a final ranking at the levels, we'll also have ranks throughout the level. These areas are versus, areas of combats in the levels which you'll be ranked for right away after a fight. It's a nice little change and you get to see how you did right there and then. As well, the final ranking of the level that adds up all these other scores, which also depends on how well you did in these areas, how many deaths you had, item uses. Oh, what a day! <laughs> I should have been a pole dancer. So the ranking system beta gives a great incentive to replay the game to see how much better you could do with your scores. So with all that talk about combat, let's talk about the enemies. A great combat system needs great enemies. So how does Bayonetta hold up? Bayonetta doesn't slack on the enemies and offers a surprisingly large catalog for us to deal with throughout our time in the game. The team went for angel enemies, as they made logical sense to face for a witch. 
The team had a lot of freedom from Kamiya with how they would appear, and what they would end up being had a look that was divine, but also quite unsettling. In this large variety of enemies we'll be dealing with, some will be heavy hitters, some will be more agile. Each enemy will have its own set of strengths and weaknesses and attack patterns. Bayonetta does a great job of getting us to encounter these enemies first on their own before adding them in with other enemies. There is quite an annoying issue though. We will get a great introduction to these enemies, and we'll be given more information about them that we can read up in the lore in our journals. But each new introduction to an enemy will have them strike you right away, like right as we get back to control. So be ready to dodge. It is kind of an odd choice. When it comes to enemies, Bayonetta is pretty forgiving for the first few levels, until you reach Grace and Glory. I think many will agree that this is when the game really starts to challenge you and get you to step up your game. They're unrelenting while taking you down quickly, so you better have a good understanding of dodge offset by then. Before we talk about the bosses, because they're always the highlight of these character action games, let's talk about the levels in Bayonetta. One thing that Camille mentioned is that he played through Devil May Cry 4 as part of his research in creating Bayonetta. And this really shows in the environments. He wanted to go for a look that feels European while still looking like no place on earth, and I think they nailed it. These designs were led by Akumi Nakamura, who you'll best remember as the lady who captured the hearts of people around the world at E3 2019. <laughs> uh, we are making a new kind of action adventure game. It's spooky. <laughs> but she took a lot of influence from Italian architecture, and the end result does feel very European, and it feels like no place on earth would be like it. We won't be spending all our times in areas like this. In fact, the game does get pretty experimental and abstract in certain areas, so there's always something new to see and explore. While the game does reuse some areas throughout, it mixes them up enough to keep us on our toes and guessing about what's coming next. Of course, we also have plenty of secret areas to find. These will offer you some combat challenges that will get you out of your comfort zone. They'll really push you in regards to coming up with solutions to help beat these challenges. The levels in Bayonetta are well laid out with some breaks in between enemy encounters, and while fairly linear, do have some areas that open up, but yet you never feel at loss of where you need to go. Unless you're DSP, who got stuck at the very beginning of the game for several minutes. Okay, now what? There's a boss? Looks like it. Uh... Are you shitting me? I was supposed to know to go through there. Oh my god. Oh, Phil. Never change. I, I did nothing wrong. I did everything correct. Some of these levels will have a boss waiting for us at the end, while some levels are devoted strictly to a boss. So let's talk about the area where I feel Bayonetta falls a bit short compared to some of its peers. <laughs> while Bayonetta has some excellent boss fights that are heads and shoulders above most games, including some boss fights that I consider some of the best around, it does fall a bit short compared to some of its peers, and I feel it's the game's biggest missed opportunity. Let's first talk about the mini-bosses. We'll have several of these in Bayonetta. Enemies that were once the end bosses of levels, we will encounter later in the game as normal enemies, sometimes many at the same time. It's a great way to show how far you've come, how much you've become better at the game, but also for Bayonetta being stronger. These fights are fine, and are steps up from enemies you've dealt with earlier in the levels, and will test your skills. Where the game has its biggest miss is the big boss fights, the one that most have a whole level devoted to them. As mentioned earlier, Kamiya played Devil May Cry 4 for research. He seemed to have a lot of influence from that one large boss fight at the end of the game. Bayonetta has five of these boss fights, four of them for the Cardinal Virtues, and then the final giant boss. Don't get me wrong, these bosses can be great. The last one in particular is a great way to end the game, with two of them easily could have been cut out and the game would have been better for it. I keep the second one at the airport and the one in the water for the amount of variety these ones have. I feel they would take a little too long to take down, and there's quite a bit of overlap in how these fights will challenge you. It's too bad because Metal Gear Rising Revengeance, another platinum game, got the bosses so right by focusing on smaller bosses with just a few large bosses sprinkled throughout. I do have to mention is that the ending of these fights are great with the climax. These are like torture attacks on steroids, where we make use of summoning demons for some really satisfying conclusions, especially the last fight. But we'll cover more of that later. How about now, Kitty? Still 
not enough, you say. You can go another round, can't you? While the large boss fights are a bit of a missed opportunity, the boss fights we have on smaller scale are some of the best around. Sean, who serves as our main rival throughout Bayonetta, we will fight up to four times. It's similar to our fights with Virgil and Devil May Cry 3, as each one ramps up with Sean having new tricks up her sleeve each time. And the last fight with Sean is not only the best part in Bayonetta, but just one of the best boss fights I've ever played. Not only is it an incredible spectacle, but it's a blast to play and it's the game's ultimate test, even if it's not the conclusion. I found myself dying just to play this fight again I was having such a blast. Which does lead me to know, I do wish Bayonetta had a boss mode in this game so you could just go right to the boss. While the large bosses you could go right to in level select, three of the four Jean fights are at the end or near the end of a level. The first Jean fight starts off a level so you could jump right to that one if you want at any point. And that's what makes the last fight such a bummer, as the worst part of Bayonetta happens just before it. So as great as Bayonetta is, there's some large noticeable flaws in a few sections of the game. These I don't find present in other character action games, or at least to the same extent. Kamiya has a deep love for classic arcade games, and with the Sega connection, he made use of it, unfortunately to the detriment of the game. Kamiya spent a lot of time and money in his younger days in arcades playing Outrun, Afterburner, and Space Harrier, so he wanted to get them in there, in which Sega allowed. I can get what they were going for here as a bit of a palate cleanser to give us some variety and breathing room. Firstly, there's the highway section as a palate cleanser, but it goes on way too long. I can see why they went for it though, since they put it in, might as well get their money's worth and time out of it. The problem I had, I'm sure many others will agree, is I just want to get back to the combat, which is the strength of the game. There's a brief section later in the game where we play as John that's like this, but it's much better, it's much more concise and feels more in line with the game. And then we have the Space Harrier section. Like the highway section, this stretches on way too long. Unless I missed in the options, you can invert your controls here. Moving the joystick up moves you down, which is really annoying. What makes this section of Bayonetta so frustrating is what follows is the best part of the game. It's the final fight with Jean. Again, if Bayonetta had a boss select mode, this wouldn't be an issue, but the fact that this section gets in the way of one of the best boss fights ever is incredibly frustrating. There is a little turret section near the end of the game that again tries to change up the pace a bit, but ends up being more of a frustrating experience than anything. On a lesser note, Bayonetta does make use of QTEs, and while annoying, it was the style of the time, and there's not a ton of them that are instant death. And if you do, you can just go right back to it. To me, it feels like something that the voices of God want to see in the game as opposed to Kamiya implementing it himself. There are some odd checkpoint locations as well. For example, the third Jean fight, if you go to the secret area, you have to go through these turbines, and you die against the fight against Jean, it will put you right there and have to go through the turbines again as opposed to the area just before Jean. There's a few moments like this in Bayonetta that are just utter head scratchers and the oversight for them being present in the game, because everything else is so good and well polished. And finally, one of the other major issues that the game has comes from cutscenes. So let's talk about the cutscenes and the story now. Don't fuck with the witch. To start right off, the cutscenes of Bayonetta are well directed, contain lots of great character interactions, and some great action. They were directed by Yuji Shimamura, who has also directed the cutscenes for Devil May Cry 3 and Devil May Cry 4. There's this really funny bit from the documentary about the making of Bayonetta, where Kamiya talks about how well Shimamura understood Bayonetta as a character. There are some sections of the cutscenes that makes use of still frames. They're still quite stylish, and I'm guessing they were used for budget reasons. But also a nice change up. So, what are these issues I have with the cutscenes? There's a number of them that could have been cut down by a third, and some even in half. For example, there's one near the end of the game where we get an exposition dump from the villain that's about 10 minutes long, and just goes on and on with nothing really happening. Sure, Metal Gear Rising did the same thing with Senator Armstrong at the end of the game, but he didn't just stand there and talk. Plus, he was just so damn charming. Whereas Balder, the antagonist in Bayonetta, just doesn't have that charisma beyond looking like David Bowie. So in regards to the story of Bayonetta, it's got some pretty deep lore and I can't say exactly have a solid grasp on it. There's quite a bit to dig through in these notes and journals. I will mention I will get briefly into some spoilers here, but nothing too much. You could see the influence of the Divine Comedy by Dante, which also makes sense with Dante and Virgil and Devil May Cry, and a book that will come up again in another video soon of Paradiso, Inferno, and Purgatory. So for the story, Benina has forgotten about her past after being discovered buried in the lake, only remembering that she is a witch. 20 years ago, you woke up stuck in a casket at the bottom of a lake. 
All you can remember is that you're a witch. What starts as a MacGuffin hunt slowly turns into Bayonetta remembering more and more about her past. Just how important of a role she plays and what is going on. The game does have an interesting intro of giving us exposition while we're playing, but I found it hard to focus on the exposition while focusing on the combat. From the records of time, there once existed two European clans who served as overseers of history for the powers that be. The Umber Witches, Dwellers of the Darkness and the Lumen Sages, Controllers of the Light. We'll meet up with the characters I discussed at the beginning of the game as we start to piece things together and gain a better understanding of what's going on. We'll learn more about the past of the Umbran Witches and the Lumen Sages and the part they played in the world of the past and how Bayonetta was a child of star-crossed lovers, something that was forbidden between a witch and a sage. Then allow me to face the outcast. None! The child is of impure blood. Throughout the game, we'll keep hearing about Jubileus from our enemies. We'll also discover more about John and how she's been mind controlled for a good portion of the game. Instead of a rival, she's a close friend of Bayonetta, and maybe even closer than you think. Thank you, Camille. And the game ends us with defeating Jubileus by summoning a demon and punching her into the sun. Never change, Kamiya. So as mentioned, the lore is pretty interesting, although I haven't sat down to try and wrap my head around it because there's quite a bit of it. The story is a bit ho-hum, but when you have such likable, fun characters, they'll carry the plot, which Bayonetta does in droves. In a lot of ways, it's kind of like Devil May Cry on that front. So like any good character action game, Bayonetta is incredibly replayable with a number of ways I covered earlier. Trying out different weapon combinations, getting better score, and you can unlock Jean, you can unlock Rodin as a secret boss, which takes quite a bit. As well, you unlock higher difficulties. And this is where the game will really test you. There will be different enemy placements than before, the enemies being much more vicious and relentless. Shit, I couldn't even defeat the first Jean encounter on hard mode, so good luck. So that is Bayonetta. It's an incredible action game, and one of those games I return to time and time again if I'm not sure what to play. This isn't the end of the series, however. While Bayonetta sold well and was well received, Sega decided to scale back on titles it published. As a result, Bayonetta 2 became a Nintendo exclusive and was released in 2014. I'm sure it will remain that way, although there are ways around it. And what about Bayonetta 3? It was first shown on December 7th, 2017. There's a Twitter account devoted to the daily status of Bayonetta 3. As of writing the script, it's been 11,172 days with very little peep about Bayonetta 3. So, who knows when we'll see it and what's been going on. So, if you haven't picked up Bayonetta, you really should. Since it launched on PC back in 2018, it's frequently on sale and frequently bundled with another excellent title from Platinum Games, The Overlooked Vanquish. So I hope you enjoyed this video on Bayonetta. It's something a bit different than what I've usually covered so far on this channel. But if you liked it, let me know. I'll still mostly focus on immersive sims, survival horrors, metroidvanias, but sometimes I'll see where the wind takes me. I do have a Patreon that I just started up if you're interested. You get access to videos early, be featured in credits, get access to my weekly newsletter style posts, you know the whole shebang with YouTube. Interact with that wacky algorithm, like, subscribe, comment, check out social media, Twitter, Discord. Have a great day everyone. Boulder Punch out.